Good morning. Um, today, it's really uh, my greatest pleasure to introduce Professor Pascal Rao from University of California, San Diego. Right now, Professor Rao is also a visiting faculty in our department. Uh, he is currently the Erickson Endowed Professor of UC San Diego EC department. He was also the uh, Center Director for Wireless Communication uh, in UC San Diego. Professor Rao has been one of the most important mentor for my career. Okay. We both graduated from uh, USC and uh, uh, working for the same advisor. So in my past 30 something years uh, of a career, Professor Rao has been a big help for my own career. Okay. Um, Professor Rao has a very uh, uh, significant career path. Uh, right now he's a fellow of IEEE. He was also the recipient of the IEEE uh, Singapore Society's uh, Technical Achievement Award recipient. His research area is mainly uh, related to the statistical estimation and optimization theory, digital signal processing, with application uh, to wireless communication, speech processing, as well as a lot of this uh, biomedical signal. So without further ado, and also he is a recipient of so many uh, best paper award in his career, which uh, you can see uh, from uh, uh, this bio introduction of the talk. So I won't, uh, I won't speak too much. I just give the floor to uh, Baska. Welcome. Thank you, Janet. He said I was his mentor, so I get credit for all the good work he's done. Okay? So I don't take credit for anything if he's done anything poorly. Okay? Uh, so what I would like to do today is, you know, as Janet said, I will be, I am a visiting faculty here, so I will be around for the quarter. So give me a few minutes to, I want to introduce myself because I'm looking forward to collaborations. Okay. So let me start with just a brief, I won't read the slide, but I wanted to share with you the kind of things I do and the kind of collaborations I will be looking forward to. Any juicy problem that has data that you're trying to manipulate and try to extract information, I'm interested in. Okay. I do have a lot of collaborations, and so I feel that collaborations help improve my portfolio so I would love to look, I look forward to talking to some of you, okay? So my, for instance, in my, uh, I have several colleagues that I collaborate with in the Center for Wireless Communication at UCSD. I have a collaborative project with uh, Dr. Garudadri in the Qualcomm Institute on hearing aids. Okay. I do work with the medical faculty, Dr. Sebastian Obazut and Thomas Liu on medical imaging. Okay. And I've also collaborated with Dr. Scott McKeague in the Center for Competition and Science. Okay. So, and all of them have actually helped me a lot in trying to give me new interesting problems that I can work with. Okay. In fact, some of the sparsity work that I did has its roots in the work that I did with Dr. Scott McKay. Okay. So, you know, if you want to talk to me after the talk and you feel there are interesting problems we can discuss, feel free to email me and I will, I will make myself available. So here's the outline of my talk. Okay. I realize not everybody is in the area that I am going to discuss, so I will try and make sure I provide enough intuition so that you can get a sense for what are the interesting techniques I'm going to develop, work with. Okay. So I'll talk briefly about what is the source localization problem. Okay. Then I will apply these ideas from compressed sensing and sparse signal recovery to solve this problem. And of those techniques, as you, if you're familiar with the field, in compressed sensing, there are many algorithms. So I'm going to talk specifically about sparse Bayesian learning. Okay. Once we are done with this, you know, the source localization problem is an old one. Okay. So one always comes back and say, what is it that you have done that is new that was not done before? Okay. So what I would like to do is come back and, and try and and provide some new insights that come with these new techniques that show why they either work better or they provide new insights into why they are useful. Okay. I may have more than I can probably present in 50 minutes. Okay. I'm probably guilty of that. 
But I will try to make sure that you at least, if I'm not able to finish, at least have a sense for all the ideas that are there in the second part. So the first part is actually quite general in the sense it can be applied to many domains, but I will focus on the social localization problem. Okay. So the problem is quite simple. You have you want to localize sources in space. Okay. And these are based on measurements that you collect from an array of sensors. Okay. And there are many applications to this. An application is an EEG, MEG, okay, for instance, radar and sonar systems, okay. uh, millimeter wave wireless communication systems, and then sound source localization, and so on. The difference between these two, all these problems is really the propagation environment. Okay? What is the model between the source and the sensor? Okay? My current motivation is really in the millimeter wave communication area. Okay? So I will try to make a case of what I'm trying to do. The goal is to localize more sources than sensors. Okay? So the question is, if I give you n sensors, how many sources in space can you localize? Okay. And this has to do with how we can do rich spatial sensing with sparse arrays. Okay. When I was actually creating the title for this talk, I toyed with the title of rich spatial sensing with sparse arrays. Okay. Then I thought maybe it'll be too specific, and so I, I chose a more uh, a different title. Okay. So, but that's really where I'm going. So let me uh, maybe say a few words on the EEG, MEG, just to show you that the range of problems on which you can apply. Okay. So here are some pictures I stole from the, from the website. Okay. This is the EEG problem, where you're making, you have a, a set of sensors on the scalp, and you're measuring the voltage. Okay. And you're trying to figure out what is the activity in the brain. Okay. Here's the MEG context. Okay. You're measuring the magnetic field, and you're trying to figure out what is, what is the activity in the brain. Okay. By the way, this is the work, first work that actually got us going down the path that I will talk about a little, okay. though I want to emphasize these problems. Okay. So here is the abstract version of this. Okay. You have a current sources in the brain due to some activation. Okay. You're making measurements on the scalp. And your goal is to figure out what is the activity in the brain. Okay. This was the work that Dr. Scott Mackig was interested in, and that's how we, we got most of this. Okay. The number of sensors you can place on the scalp is limited. Okay. But the resolution with which you want to solve the image is quite high. You would like to solve for a high resolution image. Okay. So this is really the inverse problem. Okay. What you need is a mapping from the sources to the to the sensors, and that comes from the physics of the problem in this case. Okay. So if you're interested in more in some of the details, I would I put a reference here for you to go and look, and I'm sure there are other references on this topic. Okay. But this is really the problem there. You're doing an inverse problem, and you're trying to localize sources of activity in the brain based on measurement on the scalp. Okay. The problem that I will actually focus a lot more today, though it will be in the abstract, is, is related to millimeter wave wireless communication. This is the next generation of wireless communication systems. Okay? So millimeter wave is 30 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz. Okay? So the wavelength is very small. It's a millimeter to 10 millimeters. Okay? As a result, you can put a lot of antennas on a small footprint. Okay? So imagine if the spacing is a few millimeters, you can put a lot of antennas. Okay? So for instance, it's not unusual to have 128 antennas or 256 antennas. Okay. By the way, for the, if you look at your Wi-Fi system, for instance, you'll probably see four antennas sticking out, okay? because they're all at sub-6 gigahertz. They're at a much lower frequency. Okay. The next generation wireless is expected to go to much higher frequencies, which opens up a larger bandwidth and a higher throughput. That's the vision. Okay. So now, given so many antennas, the hardware becomes very expensive. Conversion from the RF to baseband is very expensive. Okay? So what happens is you have a small number of RF chains. So that means you're converting a high dimensional signal 
to a low dimension signal in the abstract. Right? And the number of RF chains is n, which is less than n. Okay? Why is this problematic, or why is this a problem? Okay? Clearly, hardware imposes restrictions on the system. Okay? If you had actually n antennas, you have very high spatial resolution. Okay? You can point and beams at different points in space with very high precision. Okay? But now you're measuring at lower, at, at lower dimensional space. So the question is, can you still sense with the same resolution that you were sensing at, at the antenna level by a small number of sensors? How do you preserve this, this mapping? Okay? Okay. So we want rich spatial sensing with a small number of sensors. So we, you may want to think about this problem. For instance, if I have n antennas, how many sources can I localize? Okay. If you're taking a course in array processing, you probably know the answer to that one. Okay. Okay. But I will keep it a secret till I get to the end. Okay. So the question is, if I have n baseband channels, how many sources can I localize? Okay. What we have to play with, though, is the array geometry. You can play with the array geometry. And if you can play with the array geometry, maybe you can do a lot, a lot more with small number of sensors. And that's really what I will articulate today. Okay. And then I will ask, how do you extract that information? All right. All right. So this problem of localizing is, as I said, old. Okay. So what I'm going to do is apply some ideas from compressed sensing. Okay. So I want first I will talk to you about what the compressed sensing problem is, okay, or the sparse signal recovery problem is. And then I will tell you how we will apply sparse signal recovery to solve this problem. Okay. So here is the general version of compressed sensing or sparse signal recovery. Okay. I like to call it sparse signal recovery because compressed sensing has a few more things that are not necessarily present in all applications. Okay. Here you are trying to solve an underdetermined system equation. Okay. So your y is your measurement. And the dimension of that is capital N. X is a variable of interest. It's of dimension M. And M is much larger than M. Okay? And phi is your transformation matrix. And phi is often referred to as the sensing matrix or the dictionary. Okay? And your goal is given Y and phi to determine X. Okay? We know from our linear algebra class, okay, even if there is no noise, this problem does not have a unique answer okay? because you have fewer measurements than unknowns. Okay? By the way, this is the problem in MEG, for instance, or EEG. X is a voxel, which is a large number. Y is a measurement that you make at the sensors. Okay? The sensors are limited. Okay? So the question is, how do you solve this problem? Okay? One of the constraints, you have to put constraints. Otherwise, you cannot solve this problem. And the constraints you put is that the number of non-zero entries in X are small. Okay? It's what's called k-sparse. Okay? You just simply don't know the location. Okay? If you knew the location, the problem is trivial, okay? because you just throw away the columns that are not relevant, and you solve a simple linear system equation. Okay? So if finding the location is really the challenge. And once you find the location, you basically have a very simple problem. Looking forward to the array processing problem, this phi matrix is what really comes from the application. Okay? So how you construct phi comes from the application. Okay? By the way, feel free to ask questions before the end. Of, it doesn't have to wait till the end. I'm happy to answer questions. Okay? Now, the version that I would be interested in is a little slightly more general version, where we have, instead of one measurement vector, I have L measurements. Remember, I have an array of sensors. So at any given time, I get a vector. If I take it over multiple time instances, I will get a sequence of vectors. And that L here it tells me how many vectors I have. Okay. And this is the problem we are trying to solve. Now sparsity translates to row sparsity. That means we're assuming that the location of the source has not changed, so, but the signal is changing over time. Okay. So you now have what's called row sparsity, and you're trying to solve for a capital X that is row sparse. All right. Let me connect it back to the array processing problem before I talk about the Bayesian learning. Okay. 
In error processing, we have n sensors, and here's your, your signal. Okay. Why? Omega c is the carrier frequency. Okay. And n is the time index. Okay. So you have multiple sources. So you have d sources here. Okay. And x0, xl are the source signals that you're transmitting. If you think in terms of communication, it's what each user is transmitting. Okay. V is what you receive at the antennas. Okay. So this is what's called a plane narrowband signal model and plane wave assumption. So you're assuming there are plane waves that emanate from the source and reach the antennas. Okay. So this signal V here is called the area manifold. It's a function of the carrier frequency, which is known, okay, and the direction in which the source is arriving. So it's a function of two quantities. Omega c is known already, so there's nothing uncertain there. And so the, frequent, the direction information is hidden in this v. Okay. So if you have a plane wave model, the simplest way to think about this is a plane wave, when it crosses the sensor LF, causes delay across the, the LMX. Okay. So if you can measure the delays, you can get a sense for the direction of the plane wave. In the context of a narrowband signal, it corresponds to phase differences. So you're looking at the phase difference across the antennas, and the phase difference will tell you the delays. Okay. If you are, let's take a simple example, because this one will be useful for understanding. Let's say I have a uniform linear array. That means the sensors are placed on a line, and the spacing is uniform, spacing D. Okay. And typically, the spacing is half wavelength, lambda by 2. So if you actually look at the array manifold, it'll have an exponential across the array. Okay, it'll look like an exponential, but it's a spatial one. Okay? And the psi L contains the angular information. Okay? So if you're able to identify the frequency of this exponential, you're able to identify the angle. Okay? So that means the information about the angle, the direction is hidden in this array manifold. As I said before, for different problems, there's a different way in which you arrive at the sensing matrix, and this is what will happen in the communication context. So here's my direction finding as a sparse recovery problem. Okay. Remember I said there are D sources. I don't know where they are. Okay. So what we're going to do is create a grid. We're going to assume certain angles, and we're going to divide our angles very finely, and in this case, into M potential angles. We'll assume there is a source from all these angles. Okay. So our signal Y is a linear combination of M possible sources. Okay. And so we can write this as a linear system equation, and that's my linear system equation. Okay. The M keys of phi are simply samples of the array manifold. So if you have a non-uniform array, it doesn't matter what array you have. You just have to know what the array manifold is, and you simply sample. The way we go after the D sources is by imposing sparsity on X. Okay. So M is large, but we know many of these sources don't exist. So they are zero. We just don't know which ones are zero. So we achieve that by putting a sparsity constraint on X. Okay. So we solve this as a sparse signal recovery problem by just simply sampling the element. Now, once we have this problem, we can just go and use tools from compressors. Okay. By the way, I'm interested in where y is not just one vector, but y is a matrix. I collect multiple measurements. Okay. The technique I'm going to talk about is sparse Bayesian learning. Okay. There are many techniques. Okay. So I'm, if you are familiar with the field, probably many of you are familiar with L1, okay. L1 minimization. So I would like to today maybe try and convert you to a Bayesian and use a Bayesian approach to solving this problem. Okay. The approach that we'll use is we'll say, OK, we have this problem. We'll assume the vector x is a, introduce a prior on x. Okay. By the way, remember what I said in the beginning. I said if x is over, this is an underdetermined system. Unless you put constraints, you cannot solve this problem. And the way you put constraints in a Bayesian setting is by priors. You put a prior on x and use the prior to guide your solution. Okay? 
If you choose the right prior, hopefully you will get to the right solution. Okay? And the prior here is, you'll first assume, is separable. That means all the entries of x are independent, and so I can write the joint density as a product. Right? The next thing is, we'll assume that each of the entries is Gaussian with mean 0 and unknown variance gamma i. Okay? So gamma i is a power in the source along direction gamma. And we'll solve for these powers gamma i. Okay. We'll look for a maximum likelihood estimate of gamma, okay. which maximizes either the log of p of y, p of y given gamma, or the log likelihood, which is the log of p of y given gamma. Okay. We could do a map estimate by putting an additional prior on gamma. Okay. Okay. Well, this is quite interesting, though I won't pursue it. I, I brought it up here because. I know they're graduate students. So if you're looking for a rich class of priors, this, by putting a prior on gamma, you actually reach a very rich class called the Gaussian scale mixture. Okay. So you live in a very nice world. You live in a Gaussian world, a slight deviation from the Gaussian world, but you can capture a large class of priors. For instance, you can capture Laplacian student T by suitably selecting P gamma. But here, today, I will, I will just simply stick to the maximum likelihood one. Okay. This is a very simple problem, actually, if you think about it. Okay. If you hear the word Gaussian in the Bayesian context, it's music to your ears. Okay. That's probably very tractable. Okay. So if you think at all problems that you want to solve, the trick is being able to solve them. Okay. And often, if you assume priors that are, are maybe interesting but do not lead to tractability. But this one is a Gaussian setting, so everything should work quite well. Why is that? Because x is Gaussian. I'm going to assume the noise z is Gaussian. These are linear transformation of Gaussian random variables. Everything is Gaussian, so I can write all densities that I can think of in closed form. Okay. So if I want to know what is the density function of y, it's clearly Gaussian. Okay. And I can write the likelihood. Okay. So let's do that next time. Okay. So Y is, X is zero mean, Z is zero mean, so Y is zero mean. Okay. So, that's, so when I'm looking at the density function of Y, it's going to be zero mean. All I need to worry about is what is the covariance, and the covariance can be written in this fashion. Okay. This is the noise covariance, and this is the covariance coming from phi X. Okay. Gamma here is this diagonal matrix that contains the powers of the sources from different directions. Okay. And so here's my density function that I need to maximize with respect to gamma. Okay. So let's write it out. We look at the log likelihood. I'm going to minimize the negative of the log likelihood. And this is the objective function I get. Okay. There's a log determinant of sigma y. And then I have a trace operator. Okay. I write it as yy transpose simply to, because when I go to the multiple measurements where I have more than one measurement, this can be replaced by the sample correlation matrix. Okay. So r hat y is simply the sample correlation matrix that comes from the measurements. Okay. A few things I want you to keep in mind here. Okay. We want to minimize this. Okay. But it turns out this problem is not very, very convenient for optimization. Okay. The log determinant is concave in gamma. So when you're trying to minimize a function, you don't want concave function. You want convex function. Okay? The trace function is convex in gamma. Remember, gamma is part of sigma y. Okay? Sigma y has gamma in it. Okay? So all the gammas are hidden in sigma y. So this is concave in gamma. This is convex in gamma. Okay? So clearly not a desirable optimization problem. So if you're taking a course in optimization, probably you have a whole course on convex optimization how to minimize the convex objective with convex constraint. Okay? But this is not in that framework. Okay? However, the good news, so it's not that terrible, okay? because we already have some convex portion. We simply have to figure out a way to bound this function by a convex function, which you can do through majorization minimization. Okay? So you can bound this concave function, and then you can apply an iterative procedure for minimization. So it turns out there's been, yes, go ahead. Just a quick question. So um, backing up a little bit, 
why is it okay for me to have all of the x's have zero mean? Like, how does that map onto some of the problems we talked about? And okay. The other question is, where am I going to get the sparsity from in this framework? So um, where am I going to get what? Where am I going to get the sparsity? Oh. So I assume a lot of the gammas are going to end up being near zero. Yeah. Right. But why is that? Okay. So you are ahead of the game. I will get there slowly. Okay. Okay. So. The zero mean has to come, if you apply a non-zero mean, okay, then you'll be estimating the non-zero mean and the gamma. Okay? So you will have over-parameterized the system. So it's, you know, the trick in all Bayesian techniques is really not necessarily always, is it correct? Okay? Is it first some compromise between what is correct and what you want? Okay? So in this case, the way you achieve, if you put non-zero mean, then your mean has to go to zero and your gamma have to go to zero simultaneously. For you to get sparsity. Okay? Whereas here, to get sparsity, you just need the gammas to go to zero. Okay? But even if the gammas go to zero, it doesn't mean, sorry, the gamma is non zero, with zero mean doesn't mean the variable is zero, okay? because it's a random variable with, with a distribution. So you can still get a non zero quantity, even though the mean is not zero. Okay? So if you're going to sample from the distribution that you eventually arrive at with x, yeah. to, to guess where those are. So how does that sort of solve the localization problem for or do you only care about which entries are non-zero? Yeah, in a way, the answer is, if I will, I'll get there a little. So maybe just let's, let's wait till I finish the algorithm, and then we will, we will discuss that. Good question, so, okay. So there's a whole slew of algorithms that have been come up to try and solve this problem. This work, by the way, that I've talked about is by the work by tipping. So, and this is the sparse Bayesian learning and the relevance vector machine. Okay. So I do urge you to go and look at his original paper, if you wish. Okay. He was not talking about compressed sensing, none of this thing that I talked about. It was a slightly different context, but nevertheless, uh, this algorithm comes from there. Okay. The question that was asked, you know, where do you get sparsity, was my first question, by the way, when I first saw this work. Okay. They say, you know, where is sparsity here? Okay. And the way you get sparsity, by the way, is because of this concave function. Okay. So it turns out if you want sparsity, there must be a component that is somehow concave in the variable. Okay. And that will be a way to get towards sparsity. Okay. <coughs> okay. So when you're looking at sparse problem, if somebody gives you a completely convex problem, you're in trouble. But L1 is really, if you look at L1, for instance, the L1 penalty is both convex and concave on the positive quadrant. Okay? So if you look at the positive quadrant, it sits on the fence. Okay? So you're getting both benefits. Okay? So let's uh, look at a, so I'm going to talk about one algorithm just to uh, get some context, which is the EM algorithm. Okay? So I'm assuming many of you who have taken a course on estimation probably know how to do the EM, so I will just give you the recipe. So here is the problem we are trying to solve. So in the EM, you like to augment your data, and you complete the data. So in this case, you assume both y and x are given, and then you need to integrate x out. Okay. Okay. So by the way, if you're looking for a problem on EM to do some homework exercise, this is a good one, okay. because this one will give you a chance to work through completely and get nice closed form answers. Okay. So here's what happens when you do the EM. Okay. The EM is an iterative algorithm. So you start with a gamma, you assume certain power distribution, and then you update. And here's the update formula. It says the new power estimate is a function of the conditional mean of x squared plus the conditional covariance of x. Remember, everything is Gaussian. So these things are all easy to compute in closed form. Okay. Okay. So you update this. You start with a guess for the powers. You compute this conditional mean and conditional covariance, update the powers, and you repeat till it converges. Okay. If you're looking at the problem with L measurements, it has a very similar flavor, except now there are several conditional means because every measurement gives you a different conditional mean, and you have to do this average. Okay. Very simple recipe. Okay. And just to convince you that is the case, here is the conditional mean and conditional covariance. Because x is Gaussian, z is Gaussian, y is Gaussian. So x given y is Gaussian, 
And so here is my conditional mean, and here is my conditional code. Okay. So you can use this conditional mean as your point estimate. Okay. So if you ever want, at the end, if you want to know what is x, you can use the conditional mean. Okay. So you can, in fact, this is your, you can use this as your approximate posterior, if you wish, of x given y. Okay. How is sparsity achieved? Okay. Sparsity is achieved by having many of the gamma i's have zero value. Okay. So it'll turn out that as you iterate, many of the gamma i's will go to zero, and the non-zero ones will be the ones where which survive, which are the ones that are what you're after. Okay. So in, your, in this context, in our social localization problem, if any of those sources are non-zero power, then you go back and look at the array manifold to determine what is the angle that is associated with that source. Okay. I will come back to this in a minute. Now, by the way, there's a, this is non-trivial, okay? So there are a lot of papers from my group itself trying to show what are the properties of this objective function, what are the local minima, and all those. Okay? I will not talk about those today, okay? Because I do want to talk a little more about the intuition of why is SBL a good recipe for these kind of social localization problems, okay? Okay, so here's the summary in a nutshell. So I'm using p for powers, but p is the same as gamma. Okay. You initialize, you do the E step, which is a linear minimum mean squared estimation, you update the powers, and then you go back. Okay. You iterate till you converge. Okay. So let me share now, I want to go to the second part of my talk, which is what are the, why would SBL give you anything interesting compared to what was there before, okay? And how does it relate to the past? Because as I said before, the source localization problem is not a new problem, okay? Maybe I can ask if you know of any localization techniques. Maybe let me ask the audience. If I gave you this array processing problem and asked you to localize, what is the technique you would use? Anybody wants to volunteer? No one. Music. Music, okay. So music is a very popular technique. Music stands for multiple signal classification. Okay. So it is the go-to technique okay, for, for array processing. Okay. So in that sense, you know, everybody who is in array processing would probably go and use music. Okay. Today I will give you reasons why you may not want to, okay. Or why you may actually do better than music. So this is really talking about, first I'd like to connect back. So I want to point out maybe some connections to the past so that you can see the difference, okay? Because whenever a field is rich and you do something different, you have to always go back and say, did I learn, did I do anything different or am I just talking a different language, okay? <laughs> Simply you know, using a different language, okay? So I will connect it to what's called the MPDR response. This is a very powerful beamformer that is also used in array processing. Okay. Beamformer simply means a band pass filter in space. Okay. So many of you may know if I give you a signal and I say do a band pass filter, you know how to design that. Okay. When you have an array, you can do filtering in space. Okay. And what you're really doing is designing band pass filters that are in space. So they're receiving signals from a certain angle. Then I want to say something about the robustness aspect of SPL. Okay. And this is really what, why I think it, you should use this technique. It has the ability to deal with more sources than sensors. Okay. And you don't need to actually tell it. It can actually do it. It's inherent in the algorithm. Okay. And that leads to a gridless version. Okay. That means you don't need to now discretize your angles and avoid the discretization error that comes with it, okay? So there's no need to discretize, okay? So because remember what I told you, I will discretize my, my angle space and then I construct my dictionary matrix, okay? There's no need to do that. I will not have time to talk about this one, but I certainly would like to see if I can get through some of this, okay. Is there a timer somewhere here or some clock that I can see? So how am I doing? Right now it's 11.05. So I have 15 minutes, okay. 
So at least I will try and get through the first part, okay? Uh, this part, okay, and then uh, maybe leave with the rich sensing briefly, okay? So let's uh, look at the, the beam forming side. Beam forming, in your world, should be band path filtering in space. Okay? That's the way to think about this. So what you can find, you, you have this linear minimum mean squared estimation step in the SBR. Okay. You can actually write it as what's called an MPDR beam formula, followed by a simple scalar MMSE step. Okay. So let's try and understand this a little to see what it is that this is doing. Okay. What the MPDR beam formula does, by the way, it tries to form a beam, a band path filter in space to isolate a source coming from that direction, okay? So let's say I have a source on 60 degrees, I will form a band pass filter that is centered around 60 degrees, okay? And I will receive the signal, and I'll minimize the interference, okay? So this is what happens, you receive the signal, and you'll try to minimize the interference. So when you receive Rn, the output of that beam formula, you will have actually received the signal from that direction and minimize the interference. And then you do a correction factor with this C, okay, based on the statistics. You do this for every direction, by the way. Okay? So every direction of interest, you form a separate beam, and you do this update. Okay? This is a very powerful technique. So if you're not familiar with the MPDR, and you like array processing, a good topic to, to look at in more detail. Okay? But for our purposes, it's enough for you to know it's a beam form. So what is the SBL doing? SBL has an MPDR beam former built into it. Okay? It starts with initial powers, does the beam form. Okay? That means it looks for the signal in that direction. It computes the power at the output of that band pass filter and checks for consistency with the assumption. Okay? Here's the assumption. You form a beam, you get a signal, you check for the power okay, at the output of the beam power. If the power you measure is consistent with your assumption, then you stop, okay? Because now you have reached steady state, okay? So this is like a, a strategy where you make assumptions, you check for the assumption being true, and you keep doing this till there's a consistency, okay? So here's the measurement of the power, the, you update the powers, and you repeat the beam forming, okay? So this is an improvement already on the MPDR beam former, if you're familiar with it, okay? Because the MPDR beam former is a one-shot technique, okay? It does not do any update. This one says, I'm going to update, okay? The nice thing, by the way, with this strategy, though, if you think, is that once you have this signal at the output of the beam former, you have isolated the signal from a given direction, you can actually use not necessarily Gaussian statistics, but you can use different statistics on X, okay? And you can do these updates, these are scalar MMSE steps, so they're very tractable, okay? All right. So this is really a more aside, you can do more general priors, okay? So let me put these two together, okay? So just for you to, to contrast the two, okay? In the MPDR beam former, if you have what you do is you take that y and you form a correlation, a covariance matrix, okay? because this is all zero mean. Okay? And then you compute this power spectrum, spatial power spectrum, by using this formula. And this is the beam formula, one for each direction. Okay? So it's formed based on this spatial correlation matrix. Okay? One short step, okay? no iteration at all. Okay? The SBL, on the other hand, guesses the powers of the sources, okay? Forms a covariance matrix, which is coming from the model. It does not use the data, okay? It uses the data for consistency check. Okay, so this is my covariance matrix. Is the data consistent with this covariance matrix, okay? So it forms an MPDR beam former, checks for the powers, and updates the powers, okay? So the significant difference between these two, by the way, is that the MPDR beam former uses this correlation matrix, whereas SBL uses a correlation matrix that comes from the model, okay? Not from the data. It uses the model and checks for consistency between the model and the data, okay? All right. 
Why is this useful? Okay. In a minute. Okay. So let's apply this so that we can see the difference to a uniform linear array. Okay. A uniform linear array, by the way, if you have uncorrelated sources, the, the spatial covariance matrix is what's called a toplet matrix. Okay. A toplet matrix is defined by the first row. Okay. You probably saw a toplet matrix when you discussed white and stationary random processes. That's the first time you probably see a toplet matrix. Right? So this is spatially toplet. So the spatial covariance matrix is toplet. Right? And you just need to know the first row. Right? In fact, the size of the toplet matrix tells you how many sources you can identify. So given a bunch of sensors, if you can actually form a very large toplet matrix, then you can identify more sources. Okay? So in this case, it'll be if the toplet matrix is size m by m, then m minus 1 sources is what you can identify. Okay. So the RL is the correlation between two sensors. Okay. And this is, this is useful because from a uniform linear array the, and uncorrelated sources, you have this toplet covariance matrix. So let's try to put this to, to test with our SBL. Here's my covariance matrix from the measurements. Okay. Rs comes from the signals, and sigma squared is from the noise. Okay. And Rs is usually low rank based on the number of sensors. Okay. And here's Rs based on D sensors. If you look at the covariance matrix that SBL is using, it has this form, phi gamma, phi hermitian plus sigma squared i. It's completely matched to this uncorrelated model. You have to now reflect on this and say, what is the big deal? Okay. Well, whenever you do a maximum likelihood estimation, okay, in maximum likelihood estimation, you start with a model. Okay. And the model is not correct often. You assume something which may not be true. Okay. But the ML estimate is actually trying to minimize the KL distance between the assumed model and the true model. Okay. It's always trying to find this, this check. So you're trying to minimize P star is the actual model. P is the assumed model. Okay? You don't have to be perfect. As long as you're close, the ML estimate will try to make these models match as closely as possible. Okay? In the uncorrelated sources case, the true model and the SBL model are the same. Okay? So the SBL model is actually trying to match a toplet matrix to the underlying correlation matrix. Why is that important? Okay. Because if you go back, let me go back one side. If you compute the sample covariance matrix, it will never be toplets from finite samples. Okay. Even though you know it's toplets, the correlation matrix will not be toplets unless you have a large number of samples. Okay. And then the question now is, how do you find the best toplets matrix approximation to the sample data? And that's what SBL is actually doing. Okay. If you have correlated sources, okay, that means the sources are correlated, then the matrix is no longer toplets. RY is no longer toplets. But SBL is trying to find the best toplet matrix to approximate it. That means it's trying to find a way in which to decorrelate the sources even if they're not. That means the uncorrelated source model allows SBL to be largely unaffected by correlated sources. Let me show you. I think we have talked a lot of theory. Let me show you some examples, maybe, to explain this. Okay. So here I have a source where I have 12 sensors, okay, and I have 10 sources. Okay. So they're coming from different angles. Okay. And I, run, I collect data, and I run the MPDR approach. It gives me 10 peaks. Okay. Perfect. But all the sources are uncorrelated. Okay. If I correlate the sources, MPDR fails. Okay. I added correlation between sources that are coming from 140 and 160 degrees. Okay. Now the correlation matrix is no longer, does not, does not have the rank structure, if you wish. And it only can identify the uncorrelated sources. It's unable to identify 
the correlated structures. I apply music. Same problem with music. Because music also works with the same correlation matrix. Okay? It just has an eigen decomposition on the correlation matrix. Okay? If the information is not there in that correlation matrix, it cannot recover. Okay? So it fails. Okay? Here's SPR. Okay? It'll have exactly 10 non-zero entries and pretty much close to where you want. Why is that? Because it did what we wanted. It actually found a uncorrelated model that best matches the data and is able to recover the sources. Okay? So it ignores the off-diagonal terms, if you wish, okay? which is the source of the problem when you're looking at R1. Okay? Okay. Hopefully, this picture got you a little interested in, in thinking about what is it that SBL is doing in terms of being able to identify sources. It actually fits an uncorrelated source model to the data. OK. How am I doing in time? Five to 10 minutes more. OK. All right. I think I will, I will try now share with you the, the idea of more sources than sensors. Okay. That's really the, the goal. Okay. Okay. So what does that mean? You can think about if I give you an array. Okay. In this case, I'm going to talk about what are called nested arrays. Okay. In the literature on array processing, there's something called minimum redundancy arrays. These are arrays that are sparse, but have the same properties, or at least similar properties, as the full array, okay? in some sense. Of course, it cannot duplicate the properties, but it has some similarities. Okay? So here's what I will think about. A nested array, the way you can think about this, is a uniform linear array sampled through the sampling matrix S, okay? where S is a user chosen and is a P is less than M. That means I'm going from a large array to a small array. Okay. This is my millimeter wave scenario. I'm going from a large array to a small array. Okay. And S is my matrix that takes me from Y to, to the small array. It could be a random matrix. This is something that people talk about in compressed sensing. You could do what's called beam space. That means you only cover a certain region in space. Or you could do what's called thinning of the array, okay? which means select, subselect elements from the larger array. Okay? That's what I'm going to talk about today, how to subselect. Okay? So here's the, the concept behind the subarrays. Okay? You have an array. You can see that these are closely spaced, and these are spaced farther away. Okay? The way to think about this is lambda by 2. And these are much bigger than lambda by 2. But the spacing is chosen in such a way that if you check any two sensors, they'll try to give you a distinct spatial correlation lag. Okay? The spatial correlation lag will be distinct. Okay? So when you form the correlation matrix, you can form a much bigger matrix. Okay? This is what's called the different set. That means the different set has many more entries, even though the array has n entries. Okay? I will give you an example just to clarify, but this is the big picture. The way you design these arrays is you have holes in the array, but when you look at the, diff the distances between these sensors, they try to cover all possible distances. Okay? As a result, you can actually form an order n squared toplet matrix, even though you have n sensors. Okay? Think of the power of this. If I have 12 sensors, Typically, the common wisdom is 11 sources, n minus 1. This says you can go all the way to n squared, order n squared. Okay? We're talking about 12 squared, 144. That's too optimistic. It's n squared by 2. So that's 72 cents sources. Okay? Okay, so let me explain this a little more carefully okay, with an example. Okay. So here's my array with four sensors. So it's simple enough. And I place them, 1, 2, and 3, that's spacing of lambda by 2. And then 4 and 5 are missing, and I have 6. Okay. By the way, this is the work from this group. Okay. What I will show you is how SBL actually naturally does it without actually even being aware of this structure. It exploits it 
for free. If you form a correlation matrix with this four sensor element, you'll form a four by four correlation matrix. Okay? If you look at that correlation matrix, you will see that it has all it has R0, R1 all the way to R5. Okay? Because R0 is for free. Every sensor gives you R0. Okay? One means the spacing of one, which is between two and one, three and two. Okay? R2 three and one. Okay. If you want three, six and three. The distance is three. Okay. Six and two gives you spacing of four. And similarly, six and one gives you five. Okay. So you can actually form a six by six toplitz matrix given four sensors. Okay. Once you form this six by six toplitz matrix, you can identify five sources with four sensors. Okay. So now, you can estimate five sources, even though you have only, you could, in the previously, you could only do three, okay? If you follow music, you go down that path, you will be stuck with three, okay? This one says you can actually do five, okay? So there's a very much, not only can you do five, by the way, you can actually show that if you're going to do small number of sources, you can do them more accurately, okay? All right. Let me maybe, this one basically says the slide, I will go through the example, I think more interesting. It simply says that what SBL is doing is actually f trying to find an ML estimate of this larger toplitz matrix. Okay. So in this procedure, when you're finding these gammas, it's actually finding this large toplitz matrix, it's finding a maximum likelihood estimate of this larger toplitz matrix, okay. an extension of the previous work. Okay. Here's, by the way, a bigger array. It's got 12 sensors, but starts at 0, 1, and goes all the way to 41. That means if you look at the spatial matrix that you can form, 41 by 41 is what you can form. Okay? So you can actually estimate up to 40 sources with 12 sensors. Okay? Right. Let me end with a numerical result. Okay? I'm glad Jeneng mentioned music, okay? <laughs> because you can contrast music to SVR. Here's music on the larger toplitz matrix okay, on the left-hand side. And here's SBL on the data. So you just simply apply the same SBL routine I gave you. Okay. And here you have 25 sources, and the number of sensors, I think, is 12 in this example. Okay. What you'll notice is look at the clusters, the dispersion of the clusters. That tells you the accuracy. If you notice, the right-hand plot has clusters that are much tighter than the clusters on the left-hand side. The way we did this simulation is you do 100 trials, and you plot these estimates. Okay? So you get these plots, and you look at the cluster size to determine the variance. And here you will find the clusters are much tighter. Okay? So what SBL does is, find, since it finds its maximum likelihood estimate, it can actually resolve sources far more accurately. It turns out, if you look at how fast this algorithm converges with number of measurements, SBL does it much faster. Okay? So with 50 snapshots, you can get to very high accuracy, whereas the other one takes much longer. Okay? So let me end with just trying to summarize the main ideas here. Okay? You could apply, in fact, any compressed sensing kind of technique to social organization. Okay? And I've shown you how you can apply SBL. Okay. The advantage with SBL is you can actually find connections to old techniques, and you can see why it is actually doing better than old techniques. Okay. Particularly is the robustness aspect of it. Okay. It's, it's far more robust to assumptions, so even though the sources are correlated, there's no problem. The model still works. This is really what, for me, is really the important part for my millimeter wave communication problem, is I can do rich sensing with a small number of sources, sensors by just simply applying SBL with almost no change. Okay? I haven't talked to you about the gridless version, but it's, not, it's the next step in this. But clearly, this is a good way to go about trying to do more sources than sensors. 
I'm happy to I'll stop here and take questions. Yeah. Question? I have a quick one. OK. okay sure. um, from signal processing perspective, we have been uh, used to uh, building a very beautiful model in advance and try to solve this using a statistical learning theory or using optimization theory, right, with some constraint. But these days, uh, when uh, we are talking about all these uh, data-driven type of machine learning, possibly uh, people already say, forget about this, uh, all these uh, linear model, it uh, may, may not be uh, uh, really practical to the real world. Let's just use uh, data training. What's your comment on this type of approach? Yeah, no, no, that, we are doing that. So if you invited me next year, I'll probably share that with you. Okay. <laughs> so, so the sure, answer to your sure. question is yes. But I must say that what I've shared with you will tell you what you can do. Okay. So for instance, the fact that you can do so many more sources and sensors would not be done by the data-driven techniques. You would not be able to get that insight. Okay. Mm -hmm. Secondly, even in the data-driven techniques, you need to guide the data-driven techniques. Okay? So my feeling is we already have made some progress in that direction. So I already know you can do it. Okay? And you can do it for arrays with more arbitrary geometry, which you cannot do model-based. Okay? So there are areas even where models are apply, but they are, the geometry is not so pretty like a uniform linear array. So you don't have this toplet structure. Okay? So, but you can still go about using these ideas to show that you can extract more sources than sensors, and you can do it with the right architecture. So these, they guide the architecture. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Do we have any further up question? No? If not, let's give the Professor Rao another big hand. Thank you. Thank you.